Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening. I'm Professor Rios, and welcome to the first lesson of the semester. Um, this is a two-parter in terms of slides and, of course, just one video, but it basically covers uh, the first, I believe, three units in the textbook. So with that, this is not going to be administrative in any way. This is simply going to be content. Uh, for anything administrative, please refer to Brightspace and the welcome video, welcome message uh, for the particular semester. And if you have any questions, of course, contact me as soon as you can. Having said that, let's get going with part one, week one. We're going to be talking about the physical geography. So it's an introduction to physical geography. And these are the week one objectives from identifying the course requirements to basically familiarizing yourself with bright space and the setup there, introducing physical geography, planet Earth, and mapping Earth surface. So those are the three units uh, that are covered during week one. Uh, some of the contact information, of course, in Twitter or X or whatever they call it these days, at Geo101SUNY. The YouTube page where a lot of the um, playlists and videos for each week are kept. And in terms of office hour, there is a, <clears throat> a module on Brightspace. It uses Zoom. By now, everybody's pretty familiar with this. Uh, there is a set of, there's a link there with specific weekly hours. Remember, if the weekly hours that are set up do not work for you, one can be set up independently for you. And of course, email, SUNY Orange account. So because this is an online course, you really need to keep attention to the um, announcements and the emails that are sent out. Um, and I tend to do a lot of that. So just keep up. Um, I always recommend at least one signing in per day to make sure you don't miss anything. Okay. Uh, these are the required materials. So basically the Mason 5th edition book. I highly recommend the ebook. Um, and I need to change that. As you can see, it still says Blackboard, so I'll correct that. Uh, the Geo 101 Brightspace page, the Twitter feed, uh, the uh, study guide, and of course, Google Earth. So what is geography? It is a both a natural and social science that examines the spatial occurrences, distributions, and more importantly, the interrelationships between people and the environment that they occupy. In this course, we tend to focus on the natural science of things. If this were a human geography course, we would focus more on the social side of things. So, but we do, you know, the physical geography, the natural science affects people just like people can affect the natural side of the world as well. So there's always some linkage, some connection <clears throat> between the two. Physical geography, on the other hand, is think of it as an introductory level course. It examines a whole bunch of factors and processes, but it doesn't do so in a very especially deep way because there's only one semester, right? So we're going to focus on things like spatial distribution of weather, climate, systems, and landforms. That's basically what we're going to focus on <clears throat> this semester. Again, the cultural elements, obvious, population, settlement, language, religion, political systems. And then we're going to focus primarily landforms, water, weather and climate, soils rocks and minerals. So it's the natural aspect of planet Earth. The course is organized into five parts. The intro, of course, the first few lessons, atmospheric and oceanic processes, climate, including climate change, geomorphology, which is how Earth changes over time, and a little bit about the biosphere. So these are the five parts 
of the course. Again, what is geography and why should you care? You know, think about the idea of the newest volcano on Earth. It erupted in 2021, it erupted in 2022, and it erupted again in 2023. Uh, each of those eruptions basically changed the geography of Iceland. Um, each added a new cone, literally, to the landscape of southwestern Ireland, not Iceland rather, not that far from the capital of Reykjavik. And so this is sort of the earth reinventing itself all the time. Hawaii, same thing. Anywhere where a volcano has erupted recently, for example, La Palma in Spain, in the Canary Islands, or the tsunami in 2011 that affected primarily Japan, but also affected places like California and Hawaii and other parts of the Pacific Ocean. And here's an example of that. It's not a wave. It's basically the ocean being forced up like the entire volume of that water. And then it has to go somewhere. And it usually goes into sort of like protected harbors and coves. The term tsunami in Japanese means harbor wave because that's where they were primarily observed at first. Uh, think about precipitation and precipitation events. Uh, this is now an old storm from the historical perspective that happened in 2011. So many of you were probably kids who may not remember this, but this was a big deal in New York State, in Vermont, in Connecticut, in New England. Uh, this is a storm that made landfall in North Carolina and dumped anywhere between six and up to 20 inches of rain, causing significant damage in places like Newburgh in Middletown, um, all up and down the Hudson Valley. Religion. So while this may not be physical geography, it is an, a study of geography in a way, the intersection of religious domains. So if you, ever, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, I highly recommend it. It is not only historically fascinating, uh, but it is really a beautiful place with so much going on there. Antarctica, a place that you will probably never, ever, ever get to go to. In fact, most of us won't. However, it is a significant place to understanding climate change, to understanding how places are connected, because this huge giant ice cap at the southern end of the world has a significant impact on climate global, globally. Uh, here's the idea of environmental degradation. So as you can see in the white, this is a storm system uh, that uh, basically wrapped around quite tightly in the middle of China. However, because it went over a desert, it picked up all that sand and mixed it all up. So basically a lot of places here saw mud fall from the sky because the rainfall mixed in with the sand and the dust creating a very, very dirty rain. And so that has significant impacts uh, because it affects people, obviously. So here's a, in 2020, uh, so basically a Saharan dust plume. You can see here, strong winds picked up all that sand and dust and basically blew it up over the Atlantic. Some of this made it all the way to Texas. That's over 4,000 miles away. So systems are connected. This affected places like Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Florida, North Mexico, Texas. The subfields of geography. So if you think about physical geography on the inside, on the outside of this circle, you have the non-physical geography sort of like companion. So we're talking about the idea of climate, Meteorology is sort of on the other end. If you talk about geomorphology, geology is on the other end. If you're someone who cares about water resources, hydrology is on the other side. 
So geography is closely connected to many other fields, which is what kind of makes it interesting because it sort of dovetails its way through many, many, many um, disciplines that are perhaps not so geographical in nature, but that are tied to the geography, uh, in this case, physical geography. So from soil to plants, to animals, to water, to marine life, and everything on the outside is sort of the companion science to it. Think of the earth as a system science. Think of physical geography as that. You tend to have opened and closed systems. So think about the idea of the water cycle. Water on average tends to go from liquid to gas back to liquid on average about nine days. In the meantime, that water can find its way into cloud forms. It can precipitate as rainfall or snow, it can go into the ground and become groundwater, which can then feed rivers and springs. So it's a very complicated system, but it is basically one of the big drivers of weather and climate. Um, open and closed systems are subject to what are called feedbacks, which can be positive or negative. And here, positive or negative doesn't mean good or bad. Positive means reinforcing. Negative means counteracting. So an example of a positive feedback would be uh, you lose ice so you can absorb more heat, which means you get warmer, which means you lose more ice, which means you can absorb more heat, which means you can lose more ice. Get it? It sort of builds on itself. That's a positive feedback loop. And here's a couple of other examples. And here's an example of a negative one. So the volcanic activity, positive feedback, reinforcing, counteracting. Models, models are important, whether they be conceptual or numerical, because a model is a simplified version of reality. Think about taking something really, really complicated and then turning it into something much simpler, much more easily identified. So climate and weather can be very, very complicated. However, most people are at least familiar with weather maps, whether that be on a phone app or the television or some website, like the Weather Channel, for example. And because you're familiar with them, you can at least make sense of what the forecast is, even if you don't necessarily understand the physics behind it. So you've taken a very complicated system, which is weather, and you've simplified it into a easy to digest set of images that can help you hopefully make a good decision. Do you wanna have that outdoor picnic? Do you want to go out for a hike? Uh, yes or no, based on that rather simple, in that case, it would be a conceptual model. A numerical model would be what you would get from an actual computer. And it's usually data-driven, and it's a little bit more complicated, but still less so than the entirety of the data set. Okay, so it's like taking the entire planet's worth of numerical data for weather and just looking at one little area. So you've simplified it a bit. You don't care what's happening in Europe or Africa or Asia. You care about what's happening in Southern New York, Orange County, Rockland County. And you've sort of simplified it. Earth. All right, so let's look at Earth. The only true representation of the Earth is a globe. Okay, and due to rotation, the Earth is more elliptical than spherical. The Earth is a little fatter at the equator than it is at the pole. Not much, but a little bit. And of course, the Earth, as you see the different continents and oceans, 
uh, and how that's distributed. So the ocean is basically one connected ocean, really, even though we called it Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, they're all connected. You can travel from one into the other through the Arctic Ocean, back into the Pacific, Indian Ocean, and so on. So in reality, is one ocean. And then if you take the water away and you look at the land, you have what we call continental crust. No big surprise where the continents are. And oceanic crust. So if you rip away or peel away the water, the land that makes the ocean floor has its own set of mountains and very, very specific terrain that is made up of a different material than what you find over the continent. And we'll get into that later in the semester. Of course, day length is a function, and we'll get into this a little bit later, a few weeks from now, or maybe a couple of weeks from now, the idea of why day length varies. And for example, if you think of it as take the month of June, so the beginning of summer, we go back, notice how the days are longer the further north you are. And if you go all the way to the southern part of the planet, day length is zero hours. And if you're near the equator, it's always around 12. So this gives you the idea of seasons, seasonality, and the fact that the Earth is a tilted planet that revolves about the sun, and that tilt remains the same as you go around the sun. So as you orbit around the local star. And depending on time of year, in winter, we're tilted away from the sun where we live. In summer, we're tilted toward the sun. Therefore, day length is longer in June, July, August, and shorter in November, December, January. Okay? And so that's the first lesson. Now we're going to talk about the idea of mapping the surface of the Earth. So let's look into that. All right. So the objectives of this particular lesson would be understanding the idea of map scale. What are the essentials of maps? What makes a map good? What makes a map bad? Some maps are really, really awful. They may look pretty, but if they lack certain bit of information, they're kind of useless. And you really should focus on this when you see a map on news, on web pages. Uh, they need to have certain things that make up that map to make it useful. So we'll get into that. We're going to differentiate between GPS and GIS. They're not the same thing. So the only true representation of Earth is a globe or sphere. That's it. That is the only true way to represent the Earth with no error. Locations on the Earth. You can find anything, and in fact, you're a lot more familiar with this than you probably realize because when you look at your phone and you go to Google Maps and you bring it up and it has that little blue dot that tells you where you are, that is based on latitude and longitude. That's it. So a latitude is an east-west line that gives you a sense of north-south distance. So latitude zero followed by latitude north of 10 degrees. So that's 10 degrees north of zero. Latitude 20 is further north than that. 30, 40, 50, all the way to 90, which would be the North Pole. Longitude lines are lines that converge at either the North Pole or the South Pole. They are north-south lines that give you east-west distance. And when you combine longitude lines with latitude lines, you get this grid. 
And that is the makeup of every single map that you can imagine, every single application on your phone or iPad. When you go to, when you go to Google Earth or Google Maps, when you click on that Apple Maps, whatever app you use, and you see that little blue dot telling you where you are, when you are on Google Maps and it's basically telling you how to walk to wherever you want to get to, and you see that little blue dot moving, that is literally a combination of latitude and longitude on a very, very, very small scale because you're not really walking that far. That far. And here you go. Again, this is looking at the Earth, this image here on the right, looking as if you were directly over the North Pole. This is sort of looking at it on an angle. Notice how all the latitude lines converge at 90 north, and they would also converge at 90 south. And if you were to take the Earth and sort of slice it down the middle from 90 north all the way to 90 south, you see the center of the Earth, the equator, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees. We live roughly around here. New York State, namely Orange County, is around 41 degrees north. GPS. So GPS is something that provides you latitude, longitude, and elevation using satellites, typically three or more satellites. will give you a really good idea of where you are. And they can do so to a significant degree of accuracy. In remote locations, the GPS can provide you an accuracy again with just three. In many places, you have access to many more satellites. And the constellation has dozens of them. So the accuracy can be quite impressive down to the centimeter. And this is applicable and useful in so many fields. If you are, for example, in this image, these are vol volcanologists, people who care about what's happening with mountains. Is that mountain sort of bulging up? Is it changing shape? And if it does, that could mean a possible eruption. So they tend to have like measurements all over the mountain and they can tell if the mountain has basically gotten bigger, if it's inflated, so to speak. And that could potentially signify an eruption in the future. So that's where it becomes very, very, very useful. It's useful in the forecast of hurricanes, weather, um, landscape architecture, building of stadiums and towers. It is useful in so many, many things. Map scale. This is one of your homework problems for week one. And it is used to depict the relationship between size and shape on a map and the same item in the real world. It is expressed as a ratio where it can be written out graphically as a scale bar at the bottom of a map. And that's probably what you're more familiar with. This is true on Google Maps. If you look at the lower if you bring up the application, whether it be your iPhone or Samsung Galaxy or iPad or your computer at home, you will see it sort of on the lower right. And you will see a little line that will say five miles, 10 miles, 100 miles, whatever the case might be. And when it is expressed as a ratio, the smaller the number, the larger the scale because it shows a smaller area in greater detail. This is the key right here. So let's look at that. Here's an image of the United States. It basically highlights the city of Atlanta. And the scale of this map is 1 to 95 million. OK, now. Here's an image of the, a map of the southeastern United States. Atlanta is still shown here. Now it shows Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee, Mississippi, 
Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina. The scale is 1 to 38 million. Notice this graph or line here. It's 2,000 miles. Here is only 1,000 miles. Notice here it's only 400 miles. Notice here it's only 30 miles. This map is only showing you the state of Georgia and South Carolina. Here you only see the city of Atlanta. This map shows you more detail, but only a smaller area. This map shows you the entire United States. You could give someone directions on how to get from um, the city of Atlanta to Stone Mountain. Not great directions, but you could give directions. You could not give directions with this map. This is a smaller scale map. This is a larger scale map. Map Essentials. This is a great map. It has a legend. It tells you what the colors mean. It has the latitude lines, the longitude lines. It has the data categories. It gives you the source of data. It gives you the scale and the projection. It tells you direction, north, west, east, south. It is a great map. Oh, that was my lamp that just fell. Map projections. It is a method of representing the curved surface of the globe on a flat map. So when you do that, when you turn the sphere that is Earth into a flat map, you lose something. You cannot remain tr truly representative of what the Earth is like when you go from a 3D surface into a 2D surface. So you're going to lose something. You're going to distort the area, the shape, the distance, or the direction. So depending on whatever use you have for that map, you pick whatever uh, projection you see fit. So when you do a map projection, you're basically transforming that globe into a flat two-dimensional surface. So you cannot keep intact all of these properties. So basically all meridians become of equal length. They no longer converge at the poles. And the latitude lines also basically, they're all parallel to the equator, uh, but they also sort of change in the distance between them. So let's look at some examples. You can have an equal area map projection. So the, the shape is distorted, but the areas are in correct proportion to reality that you have on the Earth. You can have a conformal map. Your area is distorted. And shapes of small areas are accurately portrayed, but for example, other areas are incorrectly shown. Like for example, you can have a map that shows Africa as relatively small and Greenland as enormous. When in reality, Africa is over 13 times bigger than Greenland. So let's look at some examples. Here we go. Here's an example where you see Africa. And here you see Greenland. Notice how much Greenland looks almost as big as Africa. But in reality, Greenland is really tiny compared to Africa. You can fit 13 Greenlands in here. Notice how each latitude line as you go north gets progressively low. The distance between latitude lines gets bigger. So you're distorting the shape and the area. Notice in this map, all the longitude lines still converge at the pole, but notice how the Earth is sort of turned into like an egg. And you're showing every single landform on one side. So if you were to take a face, 
that's what would happen to the phase. It would be distorted in this form versus that same face or head of a person would be distorted like so. So again, it really depends on what you want to use that map for. This map right here is only true at the pole. And notice the distance between this longitude line and that longitude line. So here, this is the equator. This is 90 north. So this would be 80, 70, 60, 50, and so on and so on, all the way to zero. This is great for airline travel. If you're going to be flying from Florida to New York and from New York to Europe and from Europe to the Middle East and the Middle East to Asia, you can basically map it all in this one particular image. This is a great map to show weather moving across the planet. Isolines. An isoline is a line connecting points of equal anything. In this case, precipitation. Again, notice this is a good map, right? It has a legend. It has scale. It has a nice rational color scheme. It's depicting precipitation. Green makes sense. Where it is wetter, you're going to have darker green. Where it is lightest, you're going to have lighter green. And where there's no rain or little, you show it as yellow. You see the lo longitude lines and the latitude lines. Very well depicted map. Anything shown in the dark green is over 80 inches of precipitation. So there, there, there. And it shows it to you in inches and in centimeters. This map on the right is a topographic map. So you would use this if you're a hiker. If you're going to be going hiking somewhere and you want to know where some of the valleys are and where the peaks are and where you can find a uh, ridge line, this is what you would use. And you would want to find, for example, a ridge line if you're lost and you need to basically go as high as you can so that you can maybe get cell coverage. That would be kind of important. You want to be, you wouldn't want to be in a valley where the signal may not make it to your phone. You might want to find yourself as high as you can. And so this is a contour map. Again, isolines, a line that connects points of equal anything, like elevation or precipitation, these two maps. This three-dimensional view is shown as a contour map below. So this is this. Notice where the lines are close together, you have sort of a cliff where the lines are far apart it's relatively flat here's another example this is rainfall across florida the average of it again a good map it shows you selected cities here's your scale here's your legend it doesn't have latitude, it doesn't have longitude, but it's a very useful map. You can get significant information out of it. It's only specific to the state of Florida, but it tells you what part of the state is wettest. So that would be the eastern area here near Miami, and of course, the panhandle of Florida. Where do you have less rain? Looks like right down the middle. So you can make those kinds of inferences by simply looking at this map of rainfall across the state of Florida. Remote sensing. So what is it? So remote sensing is you carry one with you every day, your phone. Your phone is a remote sensor. You were born with two of them, your eyeballs. 
So uh, it's the art and the science of measuring or acquiring information on about something from a distance. So when you are at home and there is a thunderstorm in the distance with lightning, you can be far away from it. And you can obviously make that inference that that's an actual thunderstorm because you see lightning and you hear thunder. Just like your phone camera could make that, could take an image of it. And then you can send that to someone. So remote sensing, as the image implies or the name implies, uh, again, the art and the science of measuring or acquiring information on some property, and you don't have to be in physical contact with it. So a satellite image, radar, when you see radar on television, or if you have a weather app that shows you thunderstorms moving in your direction, or rainfall, or snow, or whatever, uh, that is remote sensing. Remote sensing and Google Earth. Again, you need to download Chrome or Firefox if you haven't already. In order to use Google Earth, the web version, you need it, it only works with Google Chrome or Firefox. It's a free service. There are no passwords, there are no accounts to remember, and it is used extensively during the weekly homework, sometimes up to 50% of homework points are based on Google Earth. So don't blow it off, please. Uh, remote sensing obviously focuses on the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, the sun emits energy, anything from gamma rays all the way to UV light, infrared, visible spectrum, microwaves, radio, TV. Our eyeballs can only see this, the visible spectrum. That is all we can see. Remote sensing then focuses on all, it's, it's the way of showing you the earth in a very specific way. You can color things differently to highlight certain aspects. If you want to focus on areas that are wetter, areas that are drier, where did the fire happen? Where is the fire happening? Oftentimes, when you're looking at a satellite image and there's a lot of smoke, you can't see where the fire actually is. So if you focus on the infrared, it will show you the hot spot. And then you can sort of peel away the smoke and focus on the fire. And then you can tell the aircraft that are taking water to it, hey, go here, because that's where the fire actually is. The smoke can cloud it all up. And to our eyeballs, that would be invisible. But a remote sensor can see right through that. So that's what makes it really, really useful. And here's an example. When you look at this, forest fires in the Western United States, you don't know where the fire is. But a remote sensor that peels away some of this data can tell you exactly where the hot spot is. And that's important because you can tell that aircraft full of water where to go making the fight against that fire more efficient. Or you can look at, for example, how are we losing ice in many parts of the world? Or you can see how Earth has changed over time. Here's an example. Here's the city of Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and how they've basically built these fake islands uh, and how that has changed sort of like the geography and the coastline of that particular country. Or Hurricane Irma, which basically affected uh, the Caribbean, but also Florida. And so here's, an, here's how green these islands were on August 25th of that year. And then on September 10th, look what happened. It looks like somebody just mowed it because the winds basically ripped up all the vegetation. And so it went from this sort of deep green to this very, very brown, desolate place. And you can do that with remote sensing. GIS, on the other hand, is not a remote sensor. 
GIS is the ability to, gives you the ability to layer data. So you can layer things like utilities, ownership, property lines, zones, where schools are, voting precincts, school districts, uh, socioeconomic data, income, land usage. And you can layer all those things together and it allows someone, whether it be a government person, a business person, to make a decision that hopefully makes sense. So if you have money to open up a restaurant or a mall or some sort of like strip mall, you want to basically put it in the place that will give you the most financial advantage. And you can use GIS to make that decision as efficiently as possible. Okay. And so you can use terrain models and all this other data, and you can sort of layer it all on top of itself and take one out, put another one in, and make those kinds of decisions. And these decisions have financial consequences down the line. And if you make a really good decision, then you make a really, really smart business decision and you make money. I mean, in the end, that's what a business person wants. So GIS is not GPS. So that's the end of the first lesson. Next, we start getting into the atmosphere a bit. So again, th this first lesson is just sort of giving you a flavor of what physical geography is and how it can be used. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I look forward to interacting with you. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.